All right, so, Amy, welcome. You have a new book coming out. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's called <laughs> I'm Never Gonna Write a Fucking Book, Ever. <laughs> <laughs> Cue intro. One of the things that we should probably do is, like, say who you are, et cetera, and so forth. Um, everyone yeah. knows who I am because, of course, I'm internet famous. I was for like you're 10 an, seconds. You're an influencer. That's right. I'm a thought, hey, I'm a thought leader, okay? Yeah. Uh, a thought influencer. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I cringe when people call me that. I don't like the concepts because they're very, I don't know, I think they can be very capitalist and self-aggrandizing on occasion. So if anything, I would prefer for people to call other people those things. But yeah. when other people refer to themselves as that, it's a little cringeworthy. Let's... The thing we're going to talk about today is being independent, basically, being an independent UXer. Um, I don't think it necessarily matters if it's on the research or design or strategy or whatever modifier you want to put in front of it, but um, you and I have both been independent for a while. What is What has it been like for you? Yeah. Well, right now I'm self-employed as a career coach for UX professionals, and previously I was self-employed as a UX research consultant prior to coaching, and then in between a couple of different jobs. So earlier on in my career, in the middle of my career, and now in the, this current phase of my career, and being independent looks like a lot of different things. You can be a freelancer and jump onto projects. You can have your own direct clients that you work with. You can be a contractor, which is like being an employee, but you're not really an employee. And there's mm -hmm. some nuances to all of these things. I think some of it is semantics. Some of it has to do with how you run your business. Do you run a business or do you just sign up for projects when they come? I think those are different things. I've always enjoyed it. Um, I've enjoyed things about working in house as well, working in design agencies as well. There's pros and cons to all of them. But personally, I got pretty jaded about working inside of companies and working for other people. And I don't know, made that realization that it was time for me to go back to self employment as a UX research consultant. And now as a coach and mm -hmm. sometimes I think about whether or not I would go back inside of a company and it would have to, I'll never say never, but it would have to be a really amazing opportunity where I had a lot of autonomy, mm -hmm. had to deal with minimal bullshit, <laughs> could make a bunch of money and then quit a couple of years later to go back to self-employment. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, if you figure out how to make that happen, I will subscribe to your newsletter. Um, so. Awesome. You're not already subscribed to my newsletter? Do you Wait, you have a newsletter? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I do my best to unsubscribe from things, so... I know. Um, I know. There's, everyone has a newsletter now. It's, it's a blog, but anytime I post something, it goes out to, you know, people. So. It's a blog that comes to you. Yeah, kind of like, I mean, isn't that what a blogs newsletter? always were? No. Or did you have to go to blogs? I mean, until, you know, blog lines and and uh, Google Reader were shut down. Yeah, I mean, you mm. could bring blogs to you. I think there, there are still RSS readers, but I don't think that there is in wide use. Yeah. Um, also, people don't blog anymore. They just put tweets or skeets or... Who, whoever knows what's what's going on. Medium articles. Medium articles, yes. That's like a blog except not on your own website, yeah. I guess. 
Medium's so good for writers and terrible for readers. So, so what about so, you? Well, I've been <clears throat> independent a couple of times. <laughs> uh, one time not by choice. Actually, twice not by choice due to layoffs. Yeah, this most recent stint is um, seven and a bit years now that I've been independent. I have... I try to work on interesting things, and if it's a contract, okay. If it's a project, okay. If it's stepping in to help another agency do something, okay. Um, I do have a business entity that I run everything through, but for the most part, it's I'm on the lookout for projects that reduce suffering and increase dignity. Uh, and there's plenty of that out there. It's not as much as help us sell more plastic. But, um, and you know, yeah. like you, there, there are times when I look for internal things because I'm like, uh, maybe someone else should be finding the business for me. <laughs> and sometimes where I'm like, you know, I love the fact that I can be like, well, I don't have any projects this week, so I guess it's vacation week. Not that I shouldn't be doing something, but. What is it that you most love about being independent, whether you're doing a contract or your direct client or freelancing? I think the best thing for me is the variety. And also it's a great way to test out what companies are really good to work with and which ones aren't. Mm. Um, because I know, you know, I'm sure most people have had the, that experience where, you know, they are really excited to go start working at some company and they get there and they realize what a terrible shit show it is and they can't wait to get out. Um, I find that out within the first week and the project is three weeks long. So, you know, when the project's over, I can go and not work with them again. And it's pretty easy. Or I find a great connection with a team internally and we do multiple projects together. So yeah, the big thing is the variety. Yeah. The variety is great. And like you just said, working with people who you actually enjoy working with, but having the choice to bail if you don't want to, um, you're not really vested in the same way that, you know, yeah. So I, I found that the projects that I enjoyed the most, even if the product or the goal of the project maybe wasn't my favorite, at least mm -hmm. if the people were good, if they were respectful and enjoyable to be around and not clients from hell, Hmm. then those, yeah, those absolutely were the best. Yeah. The trade-off is I am on my own a lot. I don't get to work with a consistent group of people toward a shared goal. And so it can be kind of lonely in a way. You know, even though I get to work with people, it's... Because, you know, I try and scope my projects. Someone says, hey, we've got a six-month project. And I'm like, well, okay, maybe we have actually like nine smaller projects that lead up to a final result. But the idea of a six month project, that's one, it's weird that it would take that long, but two, it's just, I try and scope things down into smaller bite-sized pieces. And, you know, usually it's one or two bite-sized pieces and then it's done. And maybe I go work with them again in a year or something, but so it's not as, not as much connection with that. I miss that um, as well. Yeah. I remember whether I was working in-house or freelance, self-employed, whatever you want to call it, I traveled. I would go to my clients' offices, whether it was here in Portland, downtown, in the Pearl District, you know, fun design agency environment, mm. um, travel all around the country, sometimes internationally. Um, of course, as a researcher, interacting with research participants and clients and stakeholders or flying to LA to give a presentation for executives, right? There was, uh, there was a lot of activity like that, a lot of social interaction and collaborating with designers and um, people on the client side and, you know, other researchers and uh, doing like automotive prototypes in person with digital and oh, cool. physical components like, yeah, there's, there's so much more of dimension to that kind of work that I definitely miss. And, you know, I have a good amount of clients. I have meetings with them. They're engaging, they're fun, but I think I've met maybe 
two or three of my clients ever in person in over three years. And I've had hundreds at this point. Right. So there's that. And yeah, I'm not working with a group of people towards a common goal. I think there is a possibility of that if somehow I were able to get onto a project in my coaching capacity uh, or work as a coach with mm -hmm. a team, with a group of people. Um, right. But, you know, yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say like my, one of my solutions for this is to try to create and be part of community online and meet other coaches and go to events and do things like that. Just have coffee chats. So at least I'm still engaging in a community and building and nurturing my network. And mm -hmm. do you have any uh, solutions for yourself to help with this? You're hilarious. Um, <laughs> do I have solutions? Of course I do. Absolutely not. Um, I mean, I, I do, but I, I feel like I just don't do, I don't do a lot of it consistently, partly because I, a lot of times the, the results that come out of it are either not beneficial or you just don't see it for a really long time. And it can be hard to really persevere it's hard for me to persevere through that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I find that I find that also like, you know, there's a couple of times where here in Portland pre pandemic, where I've tried to make space for community through events and things like that. When you're running it, it's, um, mostly thankless. It's not like I did it to earn benefit from it, but you just, don't get any benefit from it and you get people like to take and take and take. So that can be rough over a long period of time. And then entering other people's communities, I think, you know, for me, it's, it's kind of difficult to figure out how I do fit in. Hmm. Um, because a lot of times, especially for online communities, the thing that, that ends up missing is no one's really in charge of it. And that sounds semi counterintuitive because it's a community. Everybody's in charge. Everyone's there or, or there who everybody who is there can contribute. Um, but mm -hmm. that's not how communities work. I mean, it's, it's pretty, I'm sure the percentages have changed a bit over time, but like whether it's a forum or blog post comments or Slack communities or whatever, it's like somewhere between like one to 3% of the people in it are the ones who generate content and everyone else lurks mm -hmm. for the most part. Like the 80, 20 rule. Yeah. Except it's more like, you know, 95, five. <laughs> um, I've been a member of a number of Slack things. Like, I, I don't even know. There's a UX one. There's a coaching one. There's a designer one there's you know all these different ones and no one really manages the community keeps things moving and so a lot of times when people put stuff out there it's just silence and that that sort of breeds that vicious cycle of like nobody's engaging and so I kind of bail on it and I don't stick around with it and I really haven't found a place for myself online for I mean Pretty, pretty much since uh, two years into Twitter existing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I, I agree about online communities. They have to be intentional and facilitated. And if they're not, it can be pretty quiet. Um, yeah. It doesn't fulfill the potential of it. But everyone's busy. Everyone wants community, but they have a lot of stuff going on and communities out there in UX that I see that are most successful have organizers that are elected, they have boards, they yeah. have sponsors, they have a whole infrastructure for newsletters and events and social media presence and marketing and graphics and all of that stuff. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I remember the events that you used to put on before the pandemic and they were awesome. And I think even if people never told you, there was probably a lot of gratitude for what you were doing. Um, and you made them really awesome. The food. Was I was awesome. looking for Nike sponsorship deals. Uh, <laughs> it just never, <laughs> definitely not. 
Oh, good. I'm glad that you you like them. So that's yeah. good. And I know, I know, I definitely know that people like them. I don't mean to like totally gripe about it, but it was it was out of balance the feedback that I was getting. So it was either none or small amounts of positivity, mm-hmm. and one person being upset. So, but I think that's kind of the thing is you know especially if you are new to UX or if you're new to a different aspect of a career like transitioning into being independent or going from independent to going in-house figuring out like where people gather who are active and who you can count on to be helpful and not try and take advantage of you or lead you astray with their thought leadership (laughs) (laughs) um i keep coming back to that one but um thought influencership thought influencership there we go Influencer um, thoughtship. Uh, that's better. We're, we'll workshop it. Put a TM on there and get some IP <laughs> t-shirts or something. But like finding that, I think is it can be pretty challenging. Um, and like one of the top questions I hear beyond how do I get into UX is like where do I go to learn? Where do I go to get better? I always say Amy, uh, obviously. Um, different Amy, not you. Um, Aww. No. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But yeah, like, I actually kind of wonder the answer to that. Someone asked me that earlier this week. And and I was like, um, I probably should write this stuff down. But then I started writing it down. I was like, I don't really have much to say, like where to send you, like other than LinkedIn. And where do you think is a good place for people to try and find those connections? And are you wondering about people's curiosity around going into self-employment specifically or networking to make that happen or I think that's that's an aspect of it like just broadly first like the UX stuff but then specifically around like why we're gathered here today to talk about like being independent what that looks like from your perspective of like where to find and start building those those connections mm-hmm. well if it, it depends on where you're at in your career. And if you're brand new or let's say early career, that's going to look different than if you've been in it for 10 years, 20 years. Right. And Mm -hmm. you and I both have, I mean, I'm about 12, 13 years in, you're about, I don't know, double that maybe. 24. (laughs) Okay. Not, not necessarily double, but almost double. Yeah, I, I thinking back to my own career after grad school, you know, applying for a lot of jobs and finally getting my first in-house job at State Farm Insurance, where you also worked. That was my first in-house, in-house job, too. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize it was your first. Yeah. And apparently you were a rabble rouser. <laughs> <laughs> so was bit. I. A <laughs> little bit. I was talking about this earlier this week, too, with with Claire. She was like, she was saying something, I was like, it reminds me of Phil, who was like one of my managers at State Farm. And he, and he said to me, Matthew, you challenged me to be a better manager. Um, which I thought was, I thought that was a good thing. Um, looking back on it, yeah. I wish he had expanded on that a bit. It might have been helpful. But No, that is a good thing. My manager got in my face because I didn't wear business attire to facilitate a focus group. (laughs) So that's the culture of State Farm at least 10 years ago. (laughs) But yeah, um, it's interesting because I worked at State Farm for a year and change. Then I moved from Illinois to Portland and it took me about nine months to get my next full-time job at a design agency. And in Mm. those months, even though I had already been doing qualitative research in a business context, mix of like consumer research, UX research, it still took me a while to finish out that transition because I still had a lot of stuff to learn. And so there were, uh, there was a period of time where I was trying to get a new job, but also trying to gain additional experience by doing freelance work. Mm -hmm. And I did a couple of projects, you know, it was great to get that experience. I've always been of the philosophy that I think you can be a more effective freelancer, consultant, whatever you want to call it. If you have a good amount of experience, either working in an agency context where you have clients and you 
start to learn the skills of client engagement and providing a service. Mm -hmm. And if you've had in-house experience where you're inside a company that in the future you might want to work with as a freelancer, right? You understand that perspective as well. After I did some of that and then went back to consulting around like 2014, 15, I was much better prepared to jump back in, pitch clients, you know, position myself. Um, I started more frequently using LinkedIn. I had a client who found me on LinkedIn, um, you know, big uh, home improvement type company, which I felt like I made it when she messaged me. Hey, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm looking for a qual researcher to help with some projects. And I ended up doing several projects with that person, which goes back to our point about making sure you have a network um, and you're building it and not just waiting until you want to go into freelance setting that foundation up will help you with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's going to help you whether you stay in house too. It's uh, mm -hmm. the, the way to get work is have a network who can help you directly or put you in front of somebody who can help you directly. Yeah. You know, I think to your point about being prepared, like having that, that in between time of being prepared or preparing yourself to be prepared. When I think of the word independent, because I keep kind of going back to that because it sort of, in my mind, captures whether you're a contractor or a freelancer or, or, or whatever. But um, like, it, to me, it also means you're able to be independent. You're able to kick off a properly scoped project and see it through for all the things you are responsible for till the end and deliver something of quality without handholding without you're right yeah without instructions it's it's like you're doing the thing you're the expert you don't need to be told what to do you can partner and collaborate but you're not there yeah, going oh, sure. like okay well yeah. what do you want me to do and how do i do it and i think that's why that experience helps partly i don't say that to like if you don't have any experience with it, it doesn't mean you can't jump in and, and try doing it. It just means that it's probably going to be harder. And I think it's more inherent back to network to have people who know what you're trying to do and who either volunteer or you, you pay them a little bit to help you get through the project. Nothing is going to make sure you don't get hired by that company again than poor communication, poor delivery, on time, poor quality. Quite frankly, everybody. That hurts everybody in the profession mm -hmm. because it's not just your reputation, it's also your reputation as a UXer or service designer or whatever the, the title is. Yeah, so. I'm sure you've met plenty of people who <laughs> hired... And I've seen their work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and even clients who maybe have, have hired a freelancer, worked with a service provider, and that person set a certain expectation for quality or, uh, or boundaries or lack of boundaries, pricing, yeah. right? Like all of that stuff will impact the next person trying to get work. And there is a lot of competition uh, based on price. And there are a lot of uh, folks out there freelancing who for whatever reason, aren't doing the best job that they can, whether they just don't realize what it could be, or yeah. maybe they lack the actual skills. And yeah, you can go into it and figure it out. And that is what I did in, you know, 2012 and 13 after State Farm. Uh, but what I did to make that happen was I just took in as much information as I could from other people, from books, from events, just by practicing. And it was mm -hmm. nerve wracking sometimes. And I can think back and go, well, I should have said this in this way. And I, you know, the methodology I proposed for this, that was not the right one. Or even down to things like scoping and pricing. I joined up on a project with another consultant who was much more experienced than I was. And it was a great learning opportunity, but by the time I got to say the reporting part, like I did the research sessions, I was doing 
then I went to do analysis and reporting and I realized that I had already maxed out my sense for how much time and effort it would take for me to do all of these tasks as part of the project. And I mm. went back and said like, Hey, I, you know, under budgeted or whatever. And she basically said, well, that's too fucking bad for you, which isn't very nice. And I think yeah. that someone who cared would have actually guided me more effectively to go, mm, Amy, that's not enough time to do the things that you need to do or, mm, you should be charging more, right? Like I know you and I would do something like that, but this person yeah. I think just didn't see it in that way. And it left a very bitter taste in my mouth for that experience, but it taught me an important lesson that I, I guess without that guidance, I just needed to learn on my own. Yeah. And this kind of goes back, you know, we've had this conversation together and, and with other people uh, around like to me that, the example you gave where the person said too, too fucking bad. Like that's to me, that's an example of someone who thinks they're in competition with you versus awesome people like you and me. Um, yeah, obvious. <laughs> I mean, I may still think because I'm a wise ass sometime. I may think in my head, no, oh, that's too fucking bad. You should have thought of that, but that's like not what's going to come out of my mouth. I'm going to say, you know, let's, relook what could we do to make sure this doesn't happen in the future because it'll hurt you it hurts them blah 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 because i'm not in competition with anybody that's um, a, definitely a choice um it's a choice and not a choice okay so what do i mean by that if you're a you business owner that? what's that defend yourself okay what do you mean by that i have a rationale so okay. when you're a business whether you're a corporation or you're you know a uh, 10 person shop or your, you know, solo practitioner, whatever, right? Like we live in a system where we have to compete in order to make money. Like that's the nature of the system. But I also think we do have a choice as to what that looks like in practice for us, maybe on an individual or smaller scale level, um, mm -hmm. or really at any level, honestly, wherein we can go, okay, yeah, we need to make money. And we should position ourselves so that we can attract the clients and customers that we want. We don't need to serve everyone. There's plenty to go around. And so I think the choice becomes what kind of mindset can you have when thinking about running a business or pitching your services, putting proposals together, being generous and sharing resources with, let's say, other coaches or other UX consultants, right? Like, and it goes back to community. And so I think that if we practice community and mutual support, mutual aid, then it really benefits everyone. And mm -hmm. so it's not a choice, but it is also a choice. And of course, people have different, you know, money mindsets, as they say, where sure. yeah. maybe you came from a family with resources, maybe you did not, you know, everyone's financial situation is different, family situation, debts whatever it might be. But I have found that I'm happier and more successful and feel better about what I'm doing when I don't take this competitive approach and I take a more community oriented approach. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, some of the things that I know that you do really, <clears throat> I, I think I would classify as try to make the kind of work we do and how we do it less opaque across the board. So like the salary stuff that you do and because for my mind, like I'll, I'll talk to some people and they'll say, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at this thing and I think I'm going to charge about $75 an hour. And I'll be like, okay, stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe that's what you have to do for this one, but consider that actually it should be double that or whatever the, the case is given the context but if i help you get better at what you're doing if i help you better understand where the edges really are as far as pricing as far as negotiating as far as setting expectations to clients in the case we're talking about or even internally then that's actually going to make my life easier in the long term because then i don't have to keep having these conversations where this client has worked with someone who works for $40 an hour, is really quick, does okay work, 
And they're like, well, this is what we want because they do exactly what they tell us or or they do exactly what we tell them to do when really maybe what's best for them is to slow down a bit and listen to their customers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And if we can start more broadly setting those expectations with the people we work with, whether that's within teams or with clients, it's just going to make my life, this is all selfish, it's 100% selfish. It's going to make my life easier, right? Because I don't have those, I'll have those conversations less. I'll run into the roadblocks less often. So that's why I want to approach it from a perspective of I'm not really, really competing with you. And we don't need to also because if we're running our business right, and I think there are some best practices that just make sense, right? Like position yourself and have a very specific niche where possible. Mm. Um, And I think there are some benefits to generalizing. And when I was a research consultant, I wasn't a specialist. I was like a full stack UX researcher, right? Like usability, Mm. discovery research, um, automotive, you know, pet care, like government, just all kinds of stuff. And that worked. And I was actually kind of against this idea of specializing because I saw that generalizing worked for me. But as a coach now, I'm like, oh, I have a very specific niche. There are people even within UX that I refer to other folks because I don't have the expertise or I just don't want to work with those folks. And so I think that specializing helps. But I want to go back to, again, the choice of competition or a competition mindset or competitive behaviors and running a business. Capitalism, again, forces us to compete in certain ways. And if we think about what's going on right now with the tech job market, all of the layoffs, you know, we're going to be reaching 400,000 probably sometime this summer, I imagine, Mm -hmm. over the past two years. So since January 2022, there's a lot of folks out there who now are having to compete for fewer full-time roles. And then there are some folks out there who are thinking about not going back in-house and the idea of becoming a consultant or a freelancer or doing contract work. Now that we have this explosion of folks who are competing for fewer essentially roles in any kind of work, that sort of thing, I think also increases people's need, desire, or mindset to think in a more competitive way and therefore Mm -hmm. to accept pay that is lower than what they should, because maybe they're scared of negotiating and or agencies and companies that hire uh, alternative workforce, AWF, right? Contractors, gig workers, essentially, Right. know that right. they can pay less because there's a million people out there that they could hire. And so they're leveraging that, right? And you and I both know that consulting and contracting rates have not, uh, j- just like any pay out there, uh, largely speaking, they have not kept up with the times of the value of the dollar and inflation and corporate profits and all of that stuff. And so 10 years ago, I would see agencies, staffing agencies wanting to pay 50, 60, 70 bucks. And today I still see people going after jobs where they want to pay for senior level work, you know, a hundred dollars, $80. Uh, it hasn't changed. It's ridiculous. I think it's possible to get more money. And I know both you and I have had rates that are significantly higher, but that's because we have figured out a way to make that happen and to kind of maybe say no to stuff that is just ridiculously low and not right. valuing our work. But yeah, I'm, what do you think about that whole situation? Well, kind of going going in reverse, I when I decided not to go back in-house and to start my own company, the plan was to start hiring people eventually, and that happened, and then the pandemic hit, so there really wasn't a period of time where I really had employees. One of the things that I very specifically set out to do with this, at the time it was an experiment, I still kind of feel like it's an experiment now, seven years later, but I was going to say no to a lot of work if it didn't fit what I wanted to work on. And I was going to charge what I thought was appropriate. And so when I hit year six, I think 
I looked back at all the projects that tried to come in and I went through and priced them what I would price them for and just the thought experiment of assuming they said yes. It was like a million dollars of work that I said no to. And there's probably a lot of people who are going, you should have said yes to that. But the kinds of projects did not fit with what I cared to help put out into the world. Mm -hmm. Mostly I don't do hourly work at all. It's just a, a flat project fee for what the scope is. But if I were to break it down by an hourly, you know, it's going to be anywhere from probably $200 an hour to $2,500 an hour. Mm -hmm. Hourly just doesn't work. But, like, lots of people like to think in terms of hourly. So, like, you know, and I I went after projects that would fit the bill for that kind of budget. Where, you know, it was 10 grand or 20 grand to do 15 interviews for a generative research project. Mm -hmm. But it also meant that I went into debt. Mm. Because I'm kind of stubborn. Kind of? And... Mm, I don't know. Jury's still out. M more data is needed. Um, but I'm willing, and I said to to Claire, like, this is what is going to happen. And I'll do my best to bring work in, but I'm not going to work on shit. Mm -hmm. And phew, debt, debt, debt. Still got the debt. But I'm not going to give up because I think it's the right thing to do for me. But I also think that, you know, that's one of the things who would even jump in and do this kind of work in the first place? Mm. Like what kind of person should be being independent? My first thought is everyone should try it if it can, because it gives you a great perspective on what it's like to be internal. <laughs> and you're like, oh, it is better internal for some people. Yeah, I don't I don't think I actually answered your question fully, but that was like my reaction to that. It's like. Everybody's got to come to it with their own needs and context in mind. Yeah, exactly. But also, like, how much maybe try pushing some of that to make it hopefully better for yourself and better for other people. But yeah, we anyway. can do better. You're right, though. We we all make decisions based on where we're at in our lives and the information we have and our past experiences, our gut, whatever it might be. But I think the best decisions or the decisions we feel, will feel good about or even to have confidence that our decisions are the right thing is if we're really clear on our goals and yeah. the life we want and our priorities and values and those things can change over time. So maybe mm -hmm. earlier on in your career, you're like, I just want to get projects. I want to get some brand names on my resume. You know, I'll do whatever, or I want to travel a lot. And then at a certain point, you might think, you know, it's, I don't care about some of that stuff as much. Now I want to do things that are not about, you know, making a ton of money. Maybe there's money involved, but there's some, some other social benefit involved. Or, you know, I just want to do civic design type projects mm -hmm. now because I'm kind of done. Right. And, and can you afford it? Are you in a financial position or what are you willing to sacrifice? And there's, yeah, all of these things we need to figure out. And it reminds me of a project that I took on and it was a Japanese company, major brand name, messaged me out of nowhere. Hey, you know, our, our, uh, someone from our company is going to be in Portland. They want to meet with you to talk about a project. Okay. That sounds really exciting. Um, I also mm -hmm. love Japan and Japanese culture. And so I was just excited about doing business with a Japanese company. And we met up. It sounded great. And once I got more clear on the scope and the goals, I just knew that this would not be exciting. It would not be interesting. I would be bored. The pay wasn't great, but I wanted that brand name on my resume, on my website, yeah. my consulting site. And I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And I ended up subcontracting that work out, which I think is the only subcontracting I've ever done before because I just couldn't get myself to finish the project. It was actually a competitive analysis and so it wasn't primary research, but it was just a lot of like desk research. And I, I just found someone, I said, hey, can you do this? I'll pay you whatever you want. Just get it 
off my plate. I don't think I really made any profit off of it. And I learned that lesson. And yeah. I've, I've done other things like that where, you know, I, I thought like, wow, you know, I, I'm gonna have to go do this project. It's going to be fast travel. It's going to be really tiring. The pay isn't great, but I can get this thing out of it and I'll get this brand name on my resume and well, what if I can get more work? And I usually, my gut is usually pretty good about noticing when something that I am considering is not good for me. And I mm -hmm. didn't always have the tools or frameworks to pause and really sit down and think about it using like a researcher mindset, data, analyzing the data, making some conclusions, and then making the right decision based on that. And again, based on my core values and my intended lifestyle. So I've gotten a lot better at that, which is really great for being a coach because I'm, I'm pretty discerning about who I work with now. And I'm not afraid to say no. I'm not afraid to refer out even if my calendar is a little light because I know that I will not enjoy it. It's not in my target, you know, bullseye client zone. And mm -hmm. also maybe I wouldn't be able to serve that person as well. Maybe they wouldn't get as much out of it because my energy isn't there. So what do you think um, are, if you will, some of the hallmarks of someone who is going to be independent? Mm-hmm. Definitely interpersonal skills. People want to work with folks who are friendly and engaging. Yeah. And well, that's what I've been doing wrong. Okay. All right. <laughs> I've learned something. All right. Podcast over. All right. Some of us have to turn that on for a little bit, right? Yeah. Like we yeah. know that in certain interactions with clients, especially like an initial kickoff meeting or even initial meeting to get to know each other and talk about the work. There has to be like a, a mutual positive vibe if there is going to be a successful project or a yes, you know, a, a sale and a contract signed. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of the project, and you know, you have to be able to balance that without sacrificing yourself, your time. You know, you don't want to be a yes person. I think that's the worst thing that you can do as a consultant or freelancer is just be like, yes, I will do that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. I'll stay up till midnight working on this report. Oh, this random thing came up that expands the scope by 10%. Okay, fine. You know, whatever. I'll just do it anyway. Like you have to balance being amiable <laughs> and friendly and engaging, but also setting your boundaries so that you don't get taken advantage of. So you don't burn out um, and so that you're setting the appropriate expectations moving forward so that if something does come up, you can go, hey, that wasn't in the scope of the project. If you'd like to do it, let's add an addendum to the contract and we can add that on. Or, oh, this thing came up, fine, I'll do that. But then you need to do this other part, right? Yeah, yeah. It's the, the yes, if. Yes, we can do that if this following thing happens or... No, we can't do that, but I can bring someone in who specializes in that or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, everything's a negotiation, always, always, always. And I find it's best to not say yes, and it's best to not say no. It's always best to be like, yes, we could do that if the following things align or something like that. Because and otherwise you will get taken, you will get taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And then the person who comes after you is going to have the same experience. Yeah. Or you'll set a pattern so, for yourself, a pattern yeah. of a uh, lack of self-respect. And then you kind of just go with that and continue mm -hmm. to be in an abusive client relationships and be okay with that. And you know, that's, that's not good either for anyone's well being. Yeah. The other item that comes to mind for me is sales and you don't have to be salesy you know people some people are salesy some people are very much like they're gonna put on like this fancy pitch you know pitch deck and all of that and, like you know do whatever makes sense but you have to be able to sell and it's not just in the moment of convincing someone to work with you the selling happens before you even meet up with a client mm -hmm. they learn about you they come across your linkedin your website they get referred they check you out online and how can you start positioning, convincing them to contact you because they're already interested in working with you based on 
your experience and your unique approach to the work, any number of things that you might share with someone. It's kind of like the no like trust concept that we've heard about um, for many years now. It's like help someone get to know you, like you and trust you so that they want to work with you. And I would even add like help someone find you. So findable <laughs> and then yeah. knowable, likable, trust, trustable, trustworthy. And, mm -hmm. you know, repeat the selling happens before then the selling happens um, in terms of like your reputation, um, your, your expertise, which you can convey online on your website, on your LinkedIn content, YouTube podcasts, whatever it might be. And then I think something a lot of people are afraid of is having sales conversations. Yes, obviously sell sales conversations, but they don't have to feel like a sales pitch show up and just get to know them, ask mm -hmm. open-ended questions. What are they working on? What are they looking for? What are their goals? You know, just like, you don't need to scope the project in the first conversation. It's, it's not necessary and may not be helpful to do that because you want to gather that information, even get them to think about like why it is that they really need you and to reflect mm -hmm. those sorts of things back to them. Let them know that you're listening and then you can propose something that corresponds with the conversation that you had because you listened to them and you're showing that. Yeah, and I think that that's actually, even if a client or a prospect comes to you with a scope in mind, you know, we want to understand this kind of consumer in this space. It's like, okay, let's, I mean, you don't have to literally say this, but let's set that aside for a second. And like, what led to this? What things have you tried previously? How much do you know now? Like trying to get a sense of the current state before jumping into what they're wanting or think that they want for a future state. Because this is what I do all the time, especially if we need to interview 50 people. I'm like, probably don't, maybe eventually 50. But right now, let's just do 10 and we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, helping them understand what the best path forward is now based off of the constraints they have and the goals they have. And I find a lot of times if you have that conversation, you help them uncover goals that they either didn't know they had or constraints they didn't know they had. And that will help you as you work with them. Because of course, because you did this, they're going to love you and they're going to And they trust you. you. But, and they trust you. Yeah. You're watching out for yeah, them. I, I, yeah. I always... If I'm giving them something, I find that I'm not saying do spec work, but you know, if I'm giving them a little something, it it opens up that oh, he's looking out for us. Mm -hmm. It's a taster. Um, yeah, and it it gets that trust going faster. Um, it doesn't cost I, you anything either. No, no, I wouldn't like you know go back to my office and be like, all right, mock something up, and here's what it should look like. That's spec work but yeah i i feel the same way in coaching like discovery calls um is what they're sometimes referred to it's not a sales call it's a fit call and yeah yeah exactly i don't do any selling i answer their questions i give them a sense for what it's like to work with me to have a conversation is there a, a vibe and energy match can i help them like let's double check that and mm -hmm. then i say okay let me know. Sometimes they want to, you know, they're like, yeah, let's work together. Okay, cool. Hey, I need a couple days to think. Awesome. I don't push them. I don't, I don't even follow up with people who need more time. If they don't follow up with me, yeah. then that's an obvious sign that they that's don't. the answer. That's the answer. Yeah. I'm not like, yeah. Hey, what's up? Like sliding into their emails to follow up. Like it's just not necessary and it would be a waste of time and it, it works well. Um, and then, you know, some folks I don't even need to have a, a sales conversation with because they see it on my website. They email me, Hey, I propose we do this. Here's the cost. Okay, great. We don't need to have that conversation. So that's mm -hmm. another thing you can do is decide case by case. What is even required? If you work with someone over and over, you know, you might be able to just jump into projects without having certain conversations as though you were you know, newly working together. Um, I guess it really depends. So we could talk about like so many things and to be quite honest, listeners at home or viewers, 
wherever you're at. Uh, we have like a whole list of bullet points that we wanted to cover and we will not be able to cover it all. So maybe we'll do a part two where we get a bit more into the nitty gritty. But one of the things that we wanted to we put on our list are like sort of that lessons learned category of like, would we do it again? Should we stop? What should we have done from the start? Should we have stopped sooner? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Well, that's probably part three. Um, but <laughs> Like for you, like what is like the biggest, your biggest takeaway of, of going down this path? Yeah, well, I've already talked about, I think, one of the huge ones, which is not taking projects out of some fear or desire that doesn't actually align with what you care about. Yeah. Uh, and the benefits of not doing that to keep doors open for other opportunities. We've also talked about just a little bit about project scoping and scope creep and how to protect yourself from that and you know basically to set boundaries and address it if it comes up have had plenty of lessons around that even working internally i would say one that maybe doesn't come to mind so much for some people is um, how to work with your friends and so, you know, we have a UX community. Many of our friends or acquaintances work in UX. We, we have met them on the job. We've met them at meetups. If you're freelancing, if you're a consultant and they know that, they might say, hey, do you want to work together? I have a project coming up. Okay, great. And you have to balance the maintenance of your friendship with the fact that it's kind of turning into a business relationship because they, this person who essentially becomes your client has mm -hmm. their agenda, their business goals, their budgets, their timelines, people that they're accountable to, you know, teams and bosses and all of that stuff. Um, they have expectations. And I have worked with a couple of friends in the past and there's one particular set of projects. I think I did two or three for this client that were fine overall but I started to get the sense that my friend was upset about how much money I was charging. Um, I think because they have not had as much practice with negotiating their own pay, whether as a consultant mm -hmm. or an in-house UXer. And, you know, those are things that they had shared with me. But I saw it starting to surface in our interactions in reactions to my proposal proposal and my you know the budget for the project like oh my god like you charge that much or like maybe starting to nitpick things that didn't really matter that were very nitpicky and kind of annoying and I felt sometimes like they were sort of treating me like a service provider that they wanted to tell what to do versus hey can you fix this one thing you know whatever Instead of, hey, this looks like really bad and you need to do something different <laughs> or whatever. Right. So there were yeah. some little things that felt icky. And I think it did actually have a little bit of a negative impact on our friendship to some extent. Didn't destroy it. But mm -hmm. that's one thing to watch out for, especially if you're working with folks in your network, is to know what the boundaries are because things can go down the drain. Have you ever had an experience like that? I kind of... It's not so much a distinction, but like I see two categories of working with friends. I've always had great experiences when I said, you know, hey, Peter, can you help me on this project and we'll work together on it. Those have been fine. Uh, but to your point, like it's really it can get weird when it's like your friend is the person who is the decision maker somewhere that you're doing work for them rather than with them. And I definitely have, in some respects, through no fault of anybody, it just is kind of one of those things where, like, money between friends make thing, makes things weird. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I did a project a couple of years ago. A friend brought me in. They asked me to do a pro product strategy for them. I feel like I delivered on that, but I also delivered some of the organizational challenges that were going to get in the way of making that project strategy come to fruition. And that went over well with some of the executives and not well with some of the others. And I think my friend was kind of caught in between all that. Mm -hmm. And so I think 
they took sort of our internal reputation hit because of it. Mm-hmm. Lots of ways I could have, I can look back on that and, and address that differently. I still feel like I did the right thing because I actually want that company to be very successful, but they weren't going to be if they didn't figure out some of their organizational issues. Like the product strategy would could be great, but they couldn't deliver on it. Yeah. Like we haven't talked for a long time and it's been so long, it's kind of weird and I don't like it. And so I, this is probably high future Matthew who's editing this. Send an email, pick up the phone, talk to them. Okay. Yeah. It might be worth Thanks. catching up. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it just, it, it is that, that different dynamic. That's when we're working with someone versus working for someone or on behalf of someone. It's, it's a different, it's a different dynamic. So and I, th- I think I'd be more hesitant in the future to work for someone who is a friend um, unless I was just very specific and very tight on scope. And it's like, we're going to do this one thing and we're going to stick to it and that's it. Mm-hmm. Cool. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if things come up that are potentially an issue, then no surprises. Have yeah. that conversation. Yeah. Okay. How should we handle this? What are the implications? Yeah. And I think regardless, if you're working for someone or with someone who's a friend or anybody, people need to sign electronically or or in ink, an agreement of this is how we're going to work together. This is what I expect from you. This is what you can expect from me. Some people call that a statement of work. Um, some people call that, what are they called? A master service agreement, mm-hmm. which we should stop calling it. We, should, we can just call it a framework agreement. And here's the rules we're, go- we're both agreed to play by. And there are there's language in it. And this is you know getting into part two a little bit, why you should get a lawyer. But there's language in it. If something goes wrong, here's what we do. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to make it up on the spot or, or worry or wonder. Yeah. No, I, I look forward to doing a part two where we can get into some of the more tactical, logistical, business development, running a business sort of things, um, especially contracts and why they're important and why they yeah. are a pain in the ass as well. Yes, they are. Well, this I'm this is a, a nice way to dip the toes back into doing the show again so thank you amy i really appreciate it thank you for inviting me yeah i look forward to seeing you for the next one 